Hello, uh, it's brilliant to see everybody here and thanks for, for coming out. I mean, I've been to a lot of these IoT events over the last couple of years um, and I didn't know there were so many people interested in art in the technology sector, so it's brilliant to see you all here. Um, Collusion is an organisation based in Cambridge. We work at the intersection of arts, technology and human interaction. I'm one of the directors and Simon is the other. So really we're looking, uh, we're a not-for-profit organisation and we look to bring together artists, technologists, academics and others to kind of test and explore new areas, uh, experimental thinking and ideas. And so um, today obviously we're going to talk to you about one of our projects. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so as uh, Rachel was saying, um, what, one, of, one of the things we're interested in is kind of the intersection between art technology and research or human interaction. Um, we're working with Mark Farad and Mark's going to present in a minute and in particular what we're interested in with Mark's work is that there's a political dimension to it. It's not just an aesthetic piece of work. What we're looking at is a project here which is challenging some of the culture and thinking around uh, the use of data, and personal data in particular. Um, as a company, what we want to do is to work with more artists to actually bring these kind of debates out. Um, I imagine that most of the people in the room will be familiar with a lot of these debates, but we still feel um, there's a huge amount of room to, for discussion around personal data. Um, as you can see, we've been working with a number of different organisations. We've been lucky to have uh, support from Redgate for part of the initial programme. And with Mark's commission, we're working with TTP, which is the technology partnership which uh, many of you will be aware of. And we're also working um, with the University of Cambridge. Um, the interest, as far as they're concerned, is that they are very interested in knowledge transfer. They don't want all of their knowledge just to be retained within the university. They want people to engage in some of these issues. And also we're working with the Arts Council of England who have provided a, a considerable amount of funding to the opening programme. So what we want to do is to make playful, engaging work which actually um, opens up experiences. So thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I was told to introduce myself a bit first. So if you were friends with me on Facebook, this is how you would see me. So I'm Mon Frid. Um, I live in London. I was born in Leicester. I am 73 years old. And if you were to go through my friends, you'd see that they're all aged 23 to 26, roughly. Um, if you wanted to know a bit more about me, click about. Um, and you'd see that I'm atheist and I'm a member of the Labour Party. You could then see that I care that football clubs don't pay taxes, that I wonder how goats climb trees, if you ever wondered what a bold bear looked like, Leicester winning the league. This one I think is relevant, the fact that Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles, Facebook owns no media, and Airbnb own no accommodation. Um, and so on and so forth, and you get the general gist of what I'm like. Um, and then if you want to know a little bit more, you could Google me, and you'd see stuff that comes up about me. Um, predominantly one project that I launched in November last year, um, and that's called Seeing Eye. Um, so the general concept of it is that for 24 hours a day, for 28 days, I'll wear a virtual reality headset through which I will see and hear what someone else is seeing and hearing for that time. I will not take off that headset at any given time and if and when I do, that's when the project comes to an end. So this was the first test run we did. This was maybe even a year or a bit ago. Um, but just to kind of give you a better idea of kind of, you know, the natural of it. So this sort of person will be wearing a pair of glasses with three lenses built into them, binaural audio. Um, and that's what we're seeing and hearing from a first person point of view. I will shower and go to the toilet when, in, when he does, and I will also eat and drink whenever and whatever the other person does. That's to allow for complete isolation. Otherwise, I'm free to do as I please. 
So here, this was, you know, I'd had it on all day, slept with it, woke up, had breakfast, with it all on. And he went running, so I started to go running because I was bored. But ultimately, it's to see how I start to behave and whether my behaviour and mannerisms start to change. So there are um, academics and neuroscientists and brain plasticians from Cambridge who are doing research into me, among others. Um, and this will be open to public, 24 hours a day, 28 days, with live feeds. Um, and the ultimate aim is for them to be a documentary kind of culminating what happens. So after three days of not speaking to anyone, five days a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, now I'm going to start talking. But then how does that start to change? How does what I'm seeing start to affect also my thought process? With his voice being my inner monologue for so long, how do I start to behave differently? Ultimately, it's an nurture of a nature experiment. Um, so I could talk a lot about this, and I do, but... I, I'm really here for a different reason. So, but what the thing that links the two very much so in my eyes is the other person's role in this and this choice for the other person. That this is someone who's ignored quite a lot in this project and it kind of predominantly comes about me. Um, but actually we've got to this point in society where I'm not involved in the other person's selection process. So all I know is that there are heterosexual male over the age of 21 living with their partner. Um, otherwise that's it. So, this other person, we've already had hundreds of applications to be it, and we've not even put out the media side of that yet. The, this person is happy for their life to be recorded 24 hours a day for 28 days and broadcast to the world to see, theoretically. Anyone can be watching at this point. Um, and, you know, how will he start to change? How will he start to self censor is ultimately my important question on that side of things. And to paraphrase my favourite quote, when the prisoner doesn't know when he's being observed, he becomes his own guardian. And I think it's true, you know, he will start to self censor and change. Um, but then that self censoring is the truest destruction of freedom of speech, I think. It's destruction, it becomes destruction of freedom of thought. And when you destroy the freedom of thought, you don't Google something, you don't ask certain questions, you stop thinking particular things because you're not able to learn new things, and you start to conform. And, you know, conforming is following the norm. Um, but to, you know, my favorite quote followed on, and as the final step, through the use of this mechanism, one could also control the controllers. And it's true, who is in control out of me and the other person in this? He is self-censoring himself for me and limiting his actions because I am the observer, but I am the prisoner where he's able to control what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, and where I'm acting. Um, now that kind of, that paradigm shift is something that we kind of see slipping more and more and more. And, you know, when you talk about surveillance, the elephant in the room is always the National Security Agency. Um, and that is the route that this talk is going to go down for a little bit. So, you know, I'm holding my hands on now saying that. Um, that the one big question for me that couldn't be answered until relatively recently um, was, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, was under what law was the NSA able to listen to Angela Merkel's phone call? You know, it's pretty safe to assume that she wasn't a terrorist. It's pretty safe to assume, kind of, you know, she's on our side, or she's definitely not against us. Yet somehow that okay got okayed by the government or the NSA or however that theoretical system works. And it was someone called Casper Bowden who answered this question. And to those of you who don't know who he is, um, he unfortunately died last month, um, and he will be a great loss to us all. But he he studied maths at Cambridge uh, Magdalen College. Uh, before he dropped out and eventually went to go and work at Goldman Sachs, uh, where he started working on crypt uh, cryptographic software. He set up foundations in 1997 which enforced governmental changes to data mining and data protection laws, um, before he then went to work at Microsoft in 2002, where he became the chief privacy advisor for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. So, you know, it's a lot of the world. Um, and in 2011, uh, he warned government sales managers in 40 different countries that if they use Microsoft cloud-based systems, that the NSA, the FBI, and the CIA would have total access to their information. He was the first person to reveal how much cloud services expanded the capacity for state surveillance, and told Microsoft and other large com and told how Microsoft and other large companies were handing over personal data to a surveillance program called Prism. This was in 2011, two years before Edward Snowden's leaks. And it was under the law, Pfizer, or better known, I say Pfizer, better known, uh, Pfizer, which is, uh, I can't remember what it's called, sorry, um, which was created in 1978, 
uh, in response to Richard Nixon's way of monitoring activist groups and other political parties and way of stopping them working. So the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was created in 1978 and it allowed for physical and electronic collection of foreign intelligence information between foreign powers. Now, to put this into a bit of context, that was 1978. The first w website was created in 1991 by Tim Berners-Lee. That's a 13-year gap. Now, it feels safe to assume that that's the law that allows the NSA to do certain things and to have total power. But in 2008, it got put together, three bits were drawn from it, in ways that had never been put together at all. Now, the first one was that it only applied to citizens outside of the United States. Now, when we say only applies to citizens outside of the United States, that is 95% of the world's population. Second is that it allowed for remote computer services, essentially cloud computing, and this allowed access to all the data that was on those cloud computer servers. Um, and the third was that it didn't have to necessarily be related to criminality or national security. So essentially, it allowed for political spying. You know, that, I feel it is safe to assume it's one of those two, if not the same law, that enabled um, 125 different forms of Angela Merkel's communications to be intercepted, 98% of Latin America's communications that pass through the United States, as well as South America's and Amnesty International's communications. Now, this discrimination against anyone who isn't American, who isn't American, fundamentally goes against the European Human Rights Acts. Human rights are universal and have to be objective. And that does include the right to privacy. If the state is ever justified in infringing the rights to someone's privacy by way of surveillance, the justification has to remain objective. It has to be related to the person's actions or the potential of their actions, and it cannot be merely down to nationality. And especially nationality when it is your closest allies, including England, you know, but let's not forget. But strangely enough, the issue over cloud computing and discrimination rights does go back to the American Revolution and the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment was created when the British, because the British were abusing so-called general warrants. Now, general warrants allowed British redcoats to barge down the door of any American revolutionary protester, and if they were curious at what they were doing or if they wanted to steal some of their drinks or whatever they wanted to do, they could take it off them. So when they got the independence from the British, they created the Fourth Amendment. Which, which in essence specified that you needed a specific warrant and you specify the reasons why you were invading that person's privacy. So in other words, if you're not American or physically um, or located, um, sorry. Um, so that was kind of the way that they really tried to enforce it. Now last year in Congress, it was discussed whether it, the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy, essentially, apply to non-US citizens' data on cloud services. And it was decided that it didn't. So, if you're not American, if you live here like we all do, you know, 95% of the world, we have no right whatsoever to that data privacy. We have no right at all to it. Now, the European Human Rights Law, which includes the right to privacy, applies to non-Europeans. It applies to Americans, and it applies to Africans, it applies to Asians, it applies to everyone. And, but... It doesn't apply to Microsoft, Apple, Google. They don't apply the same rights to us. And in this world where they're getting more and more power, and we see a shift with all of them wanting a cloud-based system of storage, we don't have any privacy to this, and they can look at it how we want it to. And, you know, it's essentially a revolving door server for however they please. But, you know, at least it applies to Americans. Uh, so, in 2014, this was the last report of Pfizer and what they've done to the citizens in America. Uh, there are 1,416 applications made for surveillance on US citizens. 1,379 of them were for electronic surveillance, which meant that 37 of those were purely for physical surveillance only. And I feel it's pretty safe to assume that actually first electronic surveillance and then put in an application purely for a physical surveillance. Um, and of those 1,416 applications to access people's personal data, not one of them was rejected. But, you know, you've got nothing to hide, so it's fine. You know, it's fine. Uh, but as we move to this world where we are into constant surveillance and everything we are doing is being monitored or at least stored there for the potential of monitoring, I do find it quite hard to believe that something inherent won't change about the human psyche. 
Uh, this kind of where I think it links back to seeing eye in terms of the other person, in terms of how do you start self-centering. If you're truly aware that what you're doing is, has the potential for constant surveillance, of course you're going to change it. And we see ourselves self-governing every day, but that's with the release and the facade of, anonym and of anonymity to be there. But we are seeing <laughs> moments where it is starting to just fade and fade away a little bit further. So if you look at our relationship with technology as a whole at the moment, it's getting more personal, and we all know this, and it's, all, it's mediating the experience more and more to replicate kind of human interaction a bit more, and we believe that this person is then this bit of text that it shows up in. Um, but what happens when that same bit of text, that same phone that you text your loved ones with, that you work with, that you share your most intimate moment, also becomes the ultimate surveillance device that's tracking every single moment that you're doing, where you're going as much as anything else. Um, so even on the most basic level, on the most basic level whatsoever, ma many people don't realise that iPhones, amongst other brands, automatically track your locations and what you're doing, um, unless you switch it off. But you know, it does it in a lot of detail. Um, now these bits of data, data like this are being used increasingly in court cases and predominantly with divorces. And this evidence, you know, it helps the affiliated parties kind of come to their conclusion, the settlements. But actually, shouldn't the real issue be whether it's morally right to have been tracking that person without their permission, not whether it just solved this one little indiscretion that happened that one time. And even if you were to know, even if you did find out and you were to switch off particular bits of surveillance, um, you know, in 2013 in December, uh, some British people turned off the tracking side on their Google Chrome app, but Google continued to track them anyway. The case was settled by settled, I mean it was shut down with no settlement at all. And on the, on the justice that no harm was done to the parties. Now that precedent that you can track people without their permission, even when they've stated no, and the only punishment there is nothing, and to Google, you know, there really isn't anything to that effort of trying to get them to come to San Francisco for starters, which they did, um, really doesn't do anything. Um, and then you get into a problem of then, actually, what's the difference to then putting on someone's microphone or camera if they're not giving you permission? Or recording from first-person point of view, theoretically, in the future. You know, what, what actually stops you from that side of thing? Um, and to bring it to a different kind of more colloquial way where we've seen phone hacking is the phone hacking scandal, you know? That was the first real bit of public domain area of phone hacking where we've seen data mining illegal and we've kind of seen that actually not that much has come off of it legally. Um, but my real issue with the phone hacking scandal is that it never actually became a scandal. It, was, it purely became about news of the world. It became about their immorality, their, how bad their ethics are, uh, hacking into two-thirds of non-celebrities people's phones, like it's okay to hack in celebrities' phones anyway, but you know, that's kind of the train of thought argument. But in reality, it should have, again, it missed the point than this, that it should have been the argument of how was it so easy to hack into people's mobile phones, that yeah, they should all be in prison, but in reality, there should be further consequences to, and I think on the tech industry, and I think in terms of regulation, is actually kind of where I think it comes to. Now, I'm not putting this on the internet. Um, even though I have changed my password since. Um, so, so in terms of how easy it is to hack into people's phones as one of many devices, um, this is a test that we did where we made a Wi-Fi hotspot and I joined it and then I logged into my Facebook account. There's the login screen. So if you can see in the URL encoded form data at the bottom, will be all the details about his login itself, so specifically his email and password, but there's other data related to the Facebook application. So, for example, yes, his name is uh, monfrid at outlook.com and his password is Lester3. So then I went on to that, I went on to my online banking and did the same thing. Uh, wrong video, sorry. <laughs> um, well, you can see where this is going anyway, but just so you can see it. Just so you know, I have also changed the passwords, but I feel it's, not, it's a bit stupid to put it online. 112 LTR, potentially. 
Der Leute haben gesagt, das ist ein Das ist ein Master, das ist ein Kollege. Das ist ein Online-Banking-Master. Ja, so that's just, so this is the first stage of the project that I'm working on, the reason that I'm here. So once again, thank you to Collusion, um, TTP, Arts Council and Cambridge University for funding it. Um, so yeah, the, this project that we're working on is called Data Shadow. That's there you introduce slightly. Um, and the idea of it, so this is stage one of three. The idea is that it's addressing these issues that we've spoken about, but kind of more in a colloquial way, um, in a real kind of person way. So the idea of it is that it will be in a shipping container uh, in an ideal world there, but we don't know if it will be there. Um, and it will be eight metres, and the user will go through, and they will either give us permission on their phone or sign a contract. We're still discussing this. And as they walk through, um, their locations will be taken from their phone as well as the name, and I'll see this pop up on a really nicely designed map. And they'll carry on walking through, and they'll be told by a voice recording, by an automated voice recording, to make a phone call. So that person will make a phone call to their other half, let's say, from inside the shipping container. Now, outside, there'll be three phones outside of it, which any member of the public, anyone can pick up. By picking up that phone, they join in on that conversation with the user on their other half and can speak directly to them. And then as they walk to the final section of the shipping containers inside of it, we will have been tracking their movements. Um, and we'll, you know, if they start waving, we'll know that they're waving. If they're doing a handstand, we'll know that they're doing a handstand. And their text messages will also have been pulled from their phone, and that will be inserted into the outer perimeter of their shadow, and it will be projected as their data shadow. In the back will be their uh, emails, and on the right-hand side will then be their images. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the nutshell, I think, of the project. There will also be lighting, and we're also planning to do a talk um, in St. John's College um, the 26th of October, and this also opens on the 26th of October in the same place. The two can play nicely off one another. Um, and the talk, for me personally, is going to be more about... How, does, how can that data be used that we are pulling from your phone as much as the data that's on your laptop uh, or any multiple computers or whatever devices you use? Um, how can that be used in an advertising sense by kind of done with the advertising? I think I, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory how it starts to change you and manipulate certain things. I think that's predominantly through Facebook and it playing on certain securities and our need to be a celebrity. Um, but it's more on an understanding a level of how the internet is starting to function, but also on a political level, how actually is that data used and how can that be used? Or more importantly, how can it be misread? And I don't hope to purely ask the question, I hope to resolve the question by the end of the talk. Um, yeah, so one thing that I should say about this is all data will be permanently deleted every night. That is when the system is switched off. When the system is switched off, we can permanently delete everything. Um, it will only be one person at a time this is to allow it so you are the only person actually seeing your personal data but we are showing it can be taken out of it um, in terms of the ethics of the whole thing we are discussed, we are setting up an ethics committee and we are taking legal advice to discuss kind of the true core of this and what the lines are um, and yeah I guess I'm going to leave you on this point of the point of this whole project is to raise awareness for the how insecure your data is on your phone but also in cloud computing and that the two kind of are just they're the same thing but it's you know they are essentially the same thing and for those of you who say that you don't care about your personal data being taken from you give it give your phone to someone else and let them try out data shadow thank you